Hey, I'm Laura, and recently I got the opportunity to go to Texas and visit the set of the hit series The Chosen. Ahead of season three, I spoke with some of the cast and crew of the series to get their thoughts on the new season and what it's like playing such iconic figures. I hope you enjoy. Dallas Jenkins, thank you so much for chatting with us. Really I'm, appreciate it. I'm so glad, to, and, I, and I love hearing your Australian accent. My, the, our actor <laughs> who plays John uh, is an Aussie, so it's, uh, it's always good to talk Yeah, to well, with family. And then season three, this is just incredible that you've kind of got to this point. What are you trying to do with the story this time around? Well, season three is, I consider to be about the cost of following Jesus. And, what, and sometimes I use the word even confusion. The disciples are expecting certain things. They're followers of Jesus now. He's the Messiah. Mm. Uh, when is he going to overthrow the Romans? When is he going to make their lives better? Uh, in some ways, their lives are even harder than they were before they were meeting, than before they met Jesus. We really explore that. Um, we explore um, the fact that um, when, what, what, why is it that Jesus heals some and not others? Why is it that others seem to have their lives changed but not mine? Um, a lot of questions are raised. A lot of difficult questions are raised in this season. Um, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we portrayed the fact that when you've been chosen by Jesus, that doesn't necessarily mean that you've been chosen to have an easier life. Sometimes it means an even more difficult life. Do some of those questions reflect the wrestle that you feel like you've gone on and that perhaps other Christians go on in life? Yeah, uh, my wife said this recently, um, that we are not free from experiencing the lessons of the show itself. Mm. Um, it feels like when the storyline is about challenges and struggles and trying to overcome stuff, we experience it that ourselves. So I don't know how much it is the show influencing us or we're influencing the show, mm -hmm. but I do believe that God has a story to tell and he's telling it not only in the story of the first century, but in our story as well today. Um, so you see throughout season three, uh, questions being asked by characters that I think reflect questions that we ask ourselves. Mm. And I hear that you're covering a lot of really human, really everyday things like challenges in marriage, like mental health issues, like PTSD, these really big things. How do you inject these really modern issues in some respect into a story that is obviously very ancient and that wouldn't have necessarily named those things at that time as mental health, as anxiety, etc.? Well, that's the beauty of it is that when you read the Gospels or when you look at history, you realize they had the same issues we do. Now, they didn't have social media. They didn't have, they didn't have some of the, the, the means to solve some of those issues that we had, but they were longing for the same things. They had questions. They wanted intimacy. Um, they had physical maladies just like we do today. They had mental maladies just like we, today, we do today. Um, you know, when we portray the character of Matthew as being on the autism spectrum, well, they didn't call it autism back then. They probably didn't know what it was back then, but there's no reason to believe it didn't exist back then. Mm -hmm. Financial struggles, marital struggles, um, certain diseases, those still happen today. And when you realize they happened back then, that's, that's the great thing about telling a story like this, is to connect. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm injecting modern things into, into their world. I'm discovering that their world is, remains our world today. And All so right. if I can get you, the viewer, to see Jesus through the eyes of those who actually met him, and that they experience some of the same struggles that we do today, maybe you can identify with the solution to their struggles as well. And that's one of the beauty, beautiful things I think that you've done with The Chosen is that you've, whether it's a Christian audience or otherwise, you've helped people look at Jesus, look at scripture through a new lens. How did you cultivate that in your own life and in your own creativity, I suppose, to see the Bible in a different way to what traditionally so many people have? Well, I grew up in a very conservative Christian home. I was a Bible major in college at a very conservative Christian college. I, I believe very much in the foundational principles of the Bible. I would consider myself, um, in many ways, a, a fundamentalist. I'm, I'm just not angry about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, I believe very deeply in the Bible and in doctrine and in Orthodox Christianity. But even from my childhood, I was like, what must it have been like to be with Jesus around a campfire? Mm. What was it like being in school with Jesus? What was it like... Um, when, when, when Simon was up all night fishing, you know, he must have been exhausted. What, what, what would have caused him to do that, to be that desperate? I was always intrigued by the moments in between the verses. So I'm not changing what's in the Bible. Right. I, uh, the Bible is going to stay the same regardless of whether the chosen exists or not. But I do believe that some of the cultural context, historical context, and artistic context that we're providing uh, is, does reflect kind of what I loved growing up mm -hmm. um, throughout my, my relationship with God's Word. And, uh, and I think it makes the Bible stories come to life mm. in a way that it doesn't change them and certainly doesn't change yeah. the meaning of them. It makes you go, oh, I never thought of it that way. I guess they would have lived in this time period 
uh, what, what I, I guess it would have felt like that in this time period, mm -hmm. even though the Bible doesn't explicitly talk about what it might have been like. We know what it might have been like from history, and then it makes the story even more resonant. Mm. And from a storytelling point of view, Jesus is obviously a central character, right? Yes, he's God. Yes, he's Jesus. But he's also a character in this story. How do you grow and develop his character from that perspective while also recognizing that who people see him to be already has a very kind of strong context that he exists within, I suppose? Well, I think one of the things that we benefit from is that so many Jesus movies and miniseries that have been made before have focused on one thing. They tend to be going from Bible verse to Bible verse, miracle to miracle, or simply trying to reenact Bible verses. Um, or you see Mel Gibson, The Passion of the Christ, trying to just focus on the crucifixion. We're, we're focusing on the backstories. We're focusing on the relationships. We're focusing on the humanity of Jesus, even though he does miracles, even though he's clearly the Son of God, even though he claims to be God and son, the Son of God, we are showing the human relationships and the authenticity. And I think by doing that, it allows it to feel different from what's come before. Mm -hmm. And so when people say, wow, I never thought of it this way, it, they're not thinking this is different from what the Bible says. They're just thinking, oh, things make sense more to me now because mm -hmm. I'm seeing the context better. I'm realizing, oh, wow. Uh, their their problems, their questions are my problems and questions. I think mm. the humanity is the key, the key part of the show. And this season you also introduce Judas uh, a, a bit more as well. Tell us a little bit about how you've humanized the bad guy of the Bible in season three. Yeah, that was the biggest challenge we faced is we know that the moment we introduce Judas, everyone's immediately thinking, he's the one who portrays <laughs> Jesus. I'm not going to like him. Uh, and, and now we've got like four seasons to, to, to spend time with Judas. Now what we really focused on was what would the disciples have experienced when they were with Judas? I mean, at the beginning of the ministry, he was doing miracles. I mean, Jesus sent them out two by two. That mm. included Judas. He did miracles. He cast out demons. He preached sermons. He believed. He was a faithful follower of Jesus. It was a surprise to the other disciples when he did what he did. So mm. in many ways, we can just focus on the fact that he would have lived a life just like they did. We're going to treat him the same way that we do other disciples. However, in this season, because we know where the story is going, we do have to start planting some seeds, mm. showing you what might have led someone to go from, I'm a faithful follower, to I'm going to betray him. And it starts with what would have caused him, in our opinion, to betray Jesus. And then we're going to work our way backwards to lead up to that point. And what do you think that says? To th like we, I think we often, as Christians, yes. will look at the disciples and think, how could you possibly have betrayed Jesus? You were right there with him. What do you think that says that someone who was there could have ended up doing exactly what Judas did? Absolutely, and I think that's the point, is you can see the small steps that someone can take. And uh, I hope that there's a lesson for us in that. I hope that we can look at Judas, look at Herod, look at other people from the Bible that we think, oh, they're the bad guys, they're the mm -hmm. evil ones, including even some of our Pharisees, who we always look at the Pharisees as the bad guys in the Gospels, and we go, huh, they were actually really faithful, passionate believers in God. They believed in God's word. Mm -hmm. There's a reason that they thought Jesus was a threat to that. Not all of them were just selfish. Okay. I guess I'm capable of that as well. And that's what we hope people do understand from looking at someone like Judas. Yeah, and of course you're going to get new audiences, current audiences watching season three. What do you hope they take away from it? Well, I really do hope that at the end of season three, they, they believe and understand the theme, which is come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. This is a heavy season. There are some scenes and some episodes in this season that are going to cause people and viewers to be very... Uh, upset. Mm. Uh, there's a lot that goes on because our characters are upset. Um, and Jesus allows it to happen. He allows them to have pain. But um, he gives rest uh, for their souls and he gives rest for our souls. And so I am excited about uh, the fact that, uh, yes, uh, we take you through some difficult things, but we ultimately show you that there is res resolution in Christ. Yeah, well, Dallas, thank you so much for the hard work that you have done so that we can experience that as viewers. Yes. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate talking to you. Thanks so much for watching. Next time, Lara Silva, who plays Eden, talks about imagining the life of the unseen females of the Bible. We know so much about the disciples and a lot of the guys, I feel like, you know, have have um, some texts to go off of to kind of create, okay, well, who, who would this character be? You know, who, who is this disciple? But for Eden, I had to think about, well, what kind of woman would be married to Simon, you yeah. know?